So before we begin, a big thank you to my electric company for not telling me they were going to cut the power for maintenance, you know, because it's a small village. Normally they're fairly good, you know, they knock up the neighbourhood saying, hey, 10 minutes, just a 10 minute warning, in 10 minutes shit's going off, so uh, I'd save your stuff, and that's fine, that's what everybody always does, they're like, thanks for the warning, but... Not today, nah, they just couldn't be asked today, couldn't be fucked. Because if I'd have known that, I would have cancelled the render and closed my PC down to do it later. But nah, this time they're like, eh, fuck it, no 10 minute warning. So all the power goes off, rendering and subsequently corrupting the Camtasia file. So here I am, having to put it all together again. So thanks for that. And not only am I having to put this together again, but because they didn't let anybody know, it also shut off the PlayStation, so that's like 300, three hours of Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep progress down the drain. But most importantly, you dicks, my lunch was cooking. So that nice piece of tuna, well, not going to be having that now, am I? I'm just going to have to have a few ham sandwiches. So... Thanks again for that. <sighs> like a, a couple of hours worth of editing, gotta do that all again. Oh well. Breathe, relax, and we'll start again. So, this is the Octo Expansion. Again. First time for you, but again for me. Oh, would you look at the time? It's been over five years now since the original Splatoon on the Wii U. And that one person who hacked them into the game because everybody wanted them and Nintendo was like... Meet you on the battlefield. So she did what Nintendo didn't. And then Nintendo saw it and got really pissy and was even more like... Motherfucker, fuck the fucking book. And then everybody just turned into a great big shit show and the whole thing went to pot. Man, well... Uh, Yep, that's okay. That was over five years ago now, and aside from that one joke, most of the world will have forgotten about the shit show and whoever that person was and what they did. And now that you've all forgotten, it's time to milk the hell out of it. So what, are we just going to get the same model except with the drone hair? <laughs> Well, it's not just a slight model change, it's a full DLC with new levels and everything. Well, shit, I bet I get a... That's pretty good. Well done, Nintendo, and it's a paid DLC, so clearly there's been a lot of effort put in, so shit, I guess I better get changed for the occasion. Yeah, when they first came out, or should I say first scene in Splatoon 1. I loved them, and like many others, we all like, here's a couple of pictures from me, and then Stormy or Mao the Otter. Everybody got one. Everybody was like, I love them. They look better than the Inklings. They're cooler than the Inklings. And their drone armor and like brainwashing, hypnotizing goggles. Oh, of course everybody wanted it. And of course, nowadays, my affections lie elsewhere in the universe that we'll get into later. But there's the Octolings, they'll always have a special place. And they never came to Splatoon 1, kind of, but never officially came to Splatoon 1. And here they are in Splatoon 2. But we do have to buy them, so it is a bit of a bittersweet moment. But regardless, this is the Octo Expansion. So for now, all I'll say is, they're better than ever, as a lot of it does tie into the story and the gameplay, especially the story, 
and it does a really fantastic job at conveying the story and the elements within, but that's its own separate section. So for now, let's just say they're really fantastic and get right into the story so we can convey just how fantastic they are and just what a great job the graphics do at conveying and adding to the main story. So, this is why this review has been delayed for about a week, as it did come out at E3, and I played a fair bit of it across that day, and boom, I could type out half the review instantly, but it was one that had that good draw. The more I saw, the more I wanted to see, to the end, to really review it, as I was invested and I wanted to see what happens next, and certain story elements come up, and you're like, oh well hey I could I could just you know type the review but it's like yeah but Spyro you need to see it to the end to really understand the why because if you type that bit about the story because it's a spoiler so that's why I'm not saying anything but if you type about that bit and you're like oh it's to do with this well it's not to do with this because you never saw it to the end like, why is that a thing? And it's like, ah, okay. Yeah, well, at the end, you find the why. And it's like, right, well, I guess I'll delay it and I'll keep going. And I'm glad I did keep going. So the story, as you may assume from me trying not to spoil it, the spoilers will come later, is a rather interesting one. As you might have guessed via the Octo expansion we are now playing as the titular octoling this has been sought after for quite some time and while it's a far cry from what we expected you know it's it's uh, definitely not your typical reverse rebirth situation where you go through the story backwards as a quote unquote villain starting from like the final base and then getting closer to the good guys, like uh, if you think Kingdom Hearts or Castle Oblivion from Chain of Memories, Sora went up the tower, but every world he saw was in sequential order, like Traverse Town, Easy, then into Deep Jungle, Medium, into Halloween Town Hard, to Hollow Bastion, the final level, but then when you play as Riku, you obviously went through the Portal of Darkness in the first one, so the first person you saw was Maleficent in the Hollow Bastion, the final base. So then you go Hollow Bastion, hard at the start, then into Halloween Town, medium, and then to Traverse Town, easy. It kind of plays backwards. But here, it's not just your simple, you start off at the uh, Octavio area and move up through the Octo Canyon to Incopolis. It's just completely different. A full new location, new story, so clearly a lot of effort has been put into what this story is. So let's get into it, which it's incredibly well done for the most part. There are certain elements like bosses that I feel are really lazy, but I'll get more to that in the gameplay. But in terms of most of the story, it's incredibly <laughs> kill me. Well done. And by the end, the real reveal is really fucking dark. And I love the characterization and how it's all set up. It does take a lot of inspiration from Portal. Like all of the stations you will go to are called test chambers. You are a test subject and you're being pulled along by a faceless robotic voice that speaks to you in the case of the phone coaxing you on was here, much like how GLaDOS would coax you on in Portal 1, because while we do know what she is now, in Portal 1, you just woke up and GLaDOS was telling you to go on. You didn't know who she was or what she looked like until the end, so it is very heavily inspired by Portal and if you've played Portal 1, then you'll probably already guess where everything's going. But the, the, the dark twist was actually a lot more of a surprise, especially for a Nintendo game of this nature. So, yeah, you have the, the phone coaxing you onwards through these test chambers to set that sense of unease. And, as I say, they nail the unease as you go further and further 
through the chest chambers, seeing the bosses that seem to be slightly off in some way, and then as you get the, the pieces of the puzzle, and you start to piece what that puzzle is, what exactly your main goal is, you're like, oh, oh dear, that, that doesn't seem good. So, you are an octoling that wakes up in a train station with a creepy old man looming over you, and you have lost your memories. So, <laughs> ooh, that's always good when you wake up next to an old man and can't remember what happened the previous night. Here we are, children. Come and get your lollipops. Lollipops, come along, my little one. But once you have got the image of Captain Cuttlefish's wrinkly old penis out of your head, he is bad-mouthing you and basically looking for a fight. As being a war veteran, he has some deep-seated racism against that filthy German, I mean, octoling scum. Which, incidentally, due to their situation and them having to work together with their worst enemy, and showing how they bond across this journey. In the end, Splatoon 2 portrays racism far better than Detroit Become Human, a game predominantly about racism and prejudice. So, make of that what you will. So yeah, Coalfish wakes you up, and aside from his war-scarred instinct of killing those octoling scum, he has also pretty much lost his memory. Both of you are on some sort of station platform, and the only other thing around you is a mysterious phone. A phone that explains that you, the octoling, have removed the brainwashing goggles willingly, or in this case the hypno shades as they were changed to Splatoon 2 to be these uh, sunglasses, but whichever, glasses or goggles, doesn't matter. I think the goggles look cooler, but whatever, doesn't matter. You have willingly removed them and have shown free will and you like the inkling music of the Squid Sisters. This song, which I'm going to play Erase Your Chains of Love of after because Nintendo will just fucking content ID me for putting this song in. But this is the song. <laughs> And then you follow it up with a bit of Konami and Erasure. Yes, so that, that's that. Thank you, Nintendo, because you're a content ID and piece of shit, and we had to do that. But by hearing that song and becoming free, you are ready to travel to the quote-unquote promised land, where 
The air is fresh, the skies are blue, it's paradise, just like the top of the world tree. This beautiful utopia that the architect created, but only the chosen can get to the top of the world tree. And all of you scum are down at the bottom, so the quote unquote promised land. If you've played Xenoblade, you'll know what I'm talking about, if you don't, just keep the air quotes in mind, as they are very important. The phone continues on to explain that there have been others that have freed themselves from the brainwashing, and have also set out on a journey to the quote-unquote promised land, and we are number 10,008 to do so. Now, a slight nitpick, seeing the number so high, I actually thought I was the 10,008th person to activate this cutscene, but apparently not so. What would have really made this just that extra bit cooler is if the expansion or the game recognised who had bought the expansion and what number you were to activate this cutscene and it reads that online and gives you a number relative to when you activate the cutscene. Like using my changeling drone number that the beautiful red-haired princess give me, I would have been Octoling192386 to free myself in search of the quote-unquote promised land. But no, everyone is 10,008, so it kind of makes it fall apart as that means there is just uh, countless, countless 10,008s doing the same thing. But I suppose you could also argue the other way of if you were number 192386 to thwart the final boss's plans, that means that the final boss has failed 192,386 times and never learned a single thing. But it would still have been a nice touch. Anyway, the phone guy says we are deep, deep, deep underground in the depths of the old stations that sunk below the waves when humanity fell, now inhabited by the denizens of the deep, which do a really good job at adding to the world and making it feel more alive. And we have some moray eels or whatever the fuck these fish are. And ew! Oh, what the fuck is that? What the fuck is that, dude? It's like guys still beating heart in its head. Oh, what the fuck are those? Oh, the jellyfish heads are like all fused together with one red pulsing vein-like tendril. Oh, that's some fucked up shit. Which, of course, is great, as that's how the deep ocean is supposed to be creepy and fucked up and everyone agrees like this was Vinny's reaction to the dick clams. This is like nightmare fuel. You walk into an empty subway car in Manhattan and it's just a bunch of these things hanging from every fucking which way staring at you. All together now! And what makes this even cooler is that everything on this subway train, everything that gets on and off the train from the businessmen to the eels, are really creatures that really exist in the deep depths. The long-headed jellyfish, these long-headed jellies. Their heads all fuse onto that one pulsating vein. This kind of thing. That strange big mouth eel, this big mouth eel, the dick clams from Vinny's Nightmare, these things. Blobfish is obvious. As for the, the jock football men, there is a, a debate. Some say they are sea angels, these things, and I can kind of somewhat see the comparisons. Others say it's another kind of jellyfish, this one that has its intestine in its head and they changed it to a heart to be, you know, all oh, hearts are pink and it's a little bit more kid friendly than an, an intestine. Me, I would go with the latter as when I see a sea angel or hear the name sea angel, 
I would think of a more graceful, feminine, uh, Gradivore-like creature. Something that would cast invincibility or something on you. Not some crazy, roided-up football guy. Anyway, now that we're on the train, we have to stop off at the test chambers to beat them and get the four thangs. Oh, are they like tings? If we get four thangs, can we trade them to the magician and play a mini game for an extra life? Or is that tings only? Are things and uh, are thangs and tings also interchangeable in this current uh, stock market? Maybe, but we have to get the four thangs so that we can tell the conductor, "Hey, we need to take these four thangs to the phone guy. He'll show us the uh, promised land." So, where is the conductor anyway? Holy shit! Jotaro! He's in the game! Holy shit! Part, part 5 confirmed! Eh? Nani? Part 5 did get confirmed? Ah uh, shit, Nintendo knew all along! The Jojo, the Jojo maker told them that he was gonna confirm part 5 this week, so they put Jotaro in the game and released it two weeks before part 5 was announced. It's starting to make sense. It was staring us in the face all along and we just didn't see it. And now you can't tell me it's not. He's predominantly blue, like Jotaro's clothes, and that's Jotaro's hat. Look at them! I mean, of course, there is a slight difference to not have copyright, but you look at them, they are predominantly the same. The navy blue slash black hat with the little gold emblem thing on the side and the gold trim on the front. That is is the sea cucumber version of Jotaro. That is a Splatoon 2 Jotaro right there. So, with Jotaro's help, we move from test chamber to test chamber, completing more and more, and as we progress down the lines to get the four thangs, we start to see the deeper, darker mystery unfold, as with each thang we collect, we get pulled in more and more. As the first thing, we pop out the bu bubble. Oh, that's the, some kind of command console. Uh, there's buttons on the side. I see a launch pad on the inside of it. Strange looking design. Okay. I mean, nothing too suspicious, but hey, it's, it's Splatoon. They have weird designs for things. I mean, the Salmonoid's tank is a grill! Exactly! So, yeah, nothing out of the ordinary. But then we get led on a little more. We get the second one. Ah, uh, that kind of looks like some kind of smoothie jug. And that's going to connect to that bit. Well, well, that's a bit concerning, but intriguing. I'm intrigued. I'm sure this, this is fine. Nothing bad could happen from this. But you've piqued my curiosity to go on. We go further down the tracks. Harder challenges present themselves. We see more fucked up sea creatures. We get the third item. Okay, they're blades. They're blades. This is definitely a blender. This is bad juju right here. This is bad juju. That is definitely a blender. We go deeper on. The fourth part is just lid. But hey, we've got all four things. So, uh... What's the deal, phone man? Nate, the door to the promised land will now open. Anyway, you can say now. 
reading a part of a game. Oh, if you bought Octopath. Yeah, he bought Octopath. All right, so yeah, no, no, I didn't yet. Octopath Traveler Prologue demo is out. The Pinball Arcade. I bought two things. It was on the cheap end of the thing because it had um, it was with my gold points. It's called Mecco Tales and Plague Road. Please step inside. Do not be shy. Home sweet home, here we come. Are you just me, Gosh. or does that kind of look like a blender? I did not take my special cleaver with me. Oh, Reforming matter. FUCKING JESUS! WHAT THE ACTUAL FUCK NINTENDO! YOU SADISTIC BASTARDS! Yeah. So... It turns out, the deep sea, like its real life counterpart, is pretty fucking dark. And, uh, if you find all the backstory both buried in them chat logs, like how Marina is a super scientist and was Octavio's right hand girl, then you'll find exactly what the blender is about and what happened to the rest of the world. So spoilers now for the rest of the story, so put screaming clams in your ear if you don't want to hear this. So, uh, remembering Shante, half-genie hero, where the Techno Baron was turning regular girls into bootleg mermaids by letting the giant sucker fish stick to their bottoms, so it's kind of like a, a bootleg mermaid before canning them and selling them, you know, as in canned fish, you know, to be eaten. Pretty dark, but then Oh, it's Shante. It's, it's all jokes. Everything is played off for, as a light-hearted joke. Nah. Nah. Here it's like... Them other 10,007 before you? Yeah. They got blended. Their bodies got juiced. And uh, they're all goo. And all that goo in the Liberty Cannon there? Them blenders! They're blenders on the side of that limited Liberty Cannon. Where'd you think all that goo come from? That's the... That's Octoling Smoothie right there. Oh, and we can also inject Octarian Smoothie into people to mutate them into horrible monstrosities like Agent 3 or resurrect them from the dead as sanitized zombie versions. Fucking hell, Splatoon. And I thought the other part was dark that leads us into the big spoiler. So this is the... Now, the really big spoiler... As with the Statue of Liberty, this is to do with the, the final boss and a bit of the ending. So, big spoilers now. So, the big spoiler is the phone is the villain. It is like a GLaDOS situation. Who didn't see that coming? And with the phone situation, it's a phone that is taken over by the goo, kind of. So, it's basically like... Inkling or Octoling goo before Octolings ever existed and when he is monologuing in the Statue of Liberty he basically says how the professor made him uh, to basically salvage humanity after the Mushroom War and after Inklings and Octolings evolved he kind of left you alone in Splatoon 1 but then it saw how you were all selfish little bastards and you just fought over meaningless, meaningless hats and clothes and meaningless bits of land, despite being exactly the same. Like, uh, the Inklings and the Octolings are pretty much the same, barring one having a triangular head and one having a round head. Racist. So, he's gonna use the, the Octoling goo to, to wipe out all of humanity and begin anew, and he will create the ultimate life form. I'm just gonna put the I've just put these three pictures on screen. Take your pick, whichever one you'd like as the ultimate life form. We've had the ultimate life form story play out a load of times, so it, it depends if you want the, that fourth damn chaos emerald or shoop the whoop cell or the other one. So yeah, take take your pick on the ultimate life form right there. I mean, I know considering considering the train conductor. I know which ultimate life form we should go with, which is cars, so yeah, that's, 
That's the one I'll go with because we're, we're fully on the JoJo train with Joe Tro being the train driver. But yeah, that's that's about it. He wanted to uh, blast humanity away because your shit and we'll begin anew. But what's really interesting is as he dies, he's upside down, the text is fucked up. But he says that he failed the professor in his dying moments. And if you go deep into the chat logs and stuff, it turns out that the professor is the same professor that cryogenically froze Judd in the Sunken Sea Scrolls. And it may even be that the professor was also the cause of the Mushroom War. So when the Seven Rings, like this Salmonoid bit here when it says the seven rings the pink fish devoured humanity those seven rings weren't some magic rings those were nuclear bombs exploding in the skies and he may have been the cause of the nuclear war that happened and the salmonoids mutated basically rapidly from all of the radiation and toxic waste that was pouring out into the factories into the oceans like we even see this on some of the salmonoid maps like if you look at this container here that's the biohazard symbol that's the 28 days later biohazard symbol full of toxic waste so the salmonoids basically got mutated rapidly from the toxic waste that was just pouring into their parts of the ocean and then sped up again so they were mutating via the toxic waste but then sped up again by the radiation from the nuclear fallout and both the toxic waste and the nuclear war may also have been this mysterious professor's fault so this is why and uh i don't remember his name tracer you know the guy with the goggles tracer said there's gonna be no more DLC, no, make a, make a salmon expansion, you need to, like, listen to me, you have got this mysterious professor that A, froze Judd, why the hell did he freeze his cat, B, created this goo to, to remake humanity, and C, from the way that he's being portrayed, could have also pretty much started the mushroom war and mutated the salmonoids you have got a lot in this world yet to be discovered and you could easily make a salmonoid expansion i would pay the 30 dollars again i would pay the 30 dollars for the salmonoid part of this story please let it happen i mean it's all there you've got the green oceans because all like the this map, the resort, that's beautiful blue oceans. The Salmonoids, they're living in toxic oceans. Green, toxic waste filled oceans. That slime they're making, that ain't just the colour of Salmonoids. That's green toxic waste those Salmonoids are leaving behind. You've got the biohazard containers. It's all lined up. Make a Salmonoid expansion pass. I will pay $30. I'm sure a lot of other people would also pay the $30 to see the next part of this story, to see this mysterious professor, to understand, was it him that created the nuclear war? Was it him that created the Salmonoids, or did he, was he actually the good guy? Did he see the nuclear war and the Salmonoids devouring humanity and want to try and save it. Let us see the next part of the story. Don't make it Splatoon 3. There's a whole reason why Splatoon and all the others like Overwatch are live services. You can live service that shit in. And while you're at it, make a playable Salmonoid. If you don't know what one would look like, well, my good friend at DeviantArt, Game Boy Red, did this amazing half-human, half-salmon, Salmonoid girl. And then, look at that. I mean, it's not perfect. I mean, you know, it's 18, so it's got some breasts and the kids can't see those lovely jugs. But that's a good prototype. You've got the little grey bits with the, with the scales of the fish. You've got the little fins, the little fishy-eared fins. That's a, good, that's a good start. Make a salmonling. Make a playable salmonling 
and a, a salmon expansion to allude to the next part. I would pay to see that. I know a lot of other people would play to see that. Also, while you're at it, make Steelhead's clothing available in Salmon Run. Like the hat being the bomb thing on his head, the pants being the, the dungarees, the, the rubber waders, whatever. Do that. But yes, the story, if you can't tell by spending a lot, there was a lot to go through on the story, and it intrigues me more. The way that it draws you in, the way that they're saying, Oh, the professor made me, and... I failed the professor. Who's the professor? You've, you've give me the story. You've give me the hook. Now I want more. So that you can tell the story is really engaging and it pulls you in. And now, please, please, Mr. Splatoon Man. Please, I will buy your goggles. I will buy your lab coat. I will buy a fake lab coat and impersonate a squid research man just to get close to you. And force you to make a Salmon DLC so we can learn more about this world. You have made an amazing story and built up the world and made it feel alive. And now we need to see more. Moving on to the next sections, which are all going to be really short like the music. The other thing, as mentioned, that really pulls this thing up, I mean, the intro or trailer song alone should set the tone. It really shows just how far from the lively, bright city of Inkopolis we are, with some more bassier, deeper feeling tracks, opposed to those rockin' guitar riffs like from Splat Attack. course some levels that like to mix things up as there are 80 levels and we're going to talk about all those in the gameplay but for the majority of them they're all more slower more stranger more melancholic more darker to fit with that darker side of the ocean like the one that you heard mere moments ago for the transition which is from the eight ball stages i'll play a little bit more of it So yeah, they, they're all a lot more like that. As I say, there are a few more guitar riff ones, but a lot of them are more like that to really get across you're on the wrong side of the ocean. You're on the more deeper, darker side of the ocean to fit with the more sinister plot that is unfolding. And I'm really glad that they pulled this through, as with the music, I did have fears from the 1.5 update, 
or at least that's what people call it. It was where it was like a huge update. They added a hundred new items of clothes and it was where the new mode of clan blitz was introduced. But during that 1.5 update, they added 15 new tracks and uh, they're all subpar to say the least. Like I hate every time the, as I call it, Cats screaming onto n nails on a rusty chalkboard. Ugh. Hate when that one comes on. This one. Oh, that's so bad. Like, why? There were some okay ones, like the Mexican trumpet one. was okay, but certainly there were more misses than hits in 1.5. But I'm pleased to say that they went back to their roots on this one, and there is an incredible amount more hits than misses, with only maybe one or two being a bit underwhelming. And, like how we just did at the story, a little admonishing point to the end here about Steelhead Senpai and his Salmon Brethren and Sisters. As mentioned above in the story section, I said about how the phone talks about this professor, the same professor that created him, and the same professor that was the one that she sealed Judd in cryogenic chambers in the hopes of preserving his little cat beyond the Mushroom War, and has been hinted at but could very well be either the same professor that fired the nukes, or at least was the one that tried to have contingencies for when the the world fell. But if it is indeed that he is a bad guy, and General Tartar is just an evil bastard because the professor made him that way, well, he could be the one that fired the nukes, and like with Fallout, the subsequent radiation rapidly evolved your everyday fish into a cool, into a, a tidal wave of super salmon that rose up and devoured the world when the seven rings of the mushroom bombs appeared in the skies. So, when you do do a salmon run DLC, I really hope you do the music as good as you did it here, and again, also make a playable Salmon Ling, as that would be amazing, and the very talented Game Boy Red has even give you a good first draft. And if you do do this, something I would love to see, although it is just purely a fantasy at this point, but I think it would be the most fitting, is I would love to have the gorillas work on the Salmon music, as when you do do a Salmon DLC, which you will, Okay, because there's no reason not to. You can just patch the live stuff in. Again, it's a live service. You can just patch it in. So when you do do a Salmon Run DLC, and you will, or I will come to Reggie's house and knock on his door and ask him in a very polite British manner to do it. When you do do it, please add the gorillas to your your list of artists that you will collaborate with. As while working on this review, the Gorilla's new album, The Now Now, came out, and I've just been listening to that and all their previous tracks while I was typing this, and while going through the Plastic Beach section, a predominantly watery, tropical-like album, I realised just how similar some parts are to, like, Splatoon tracks with the with the more aquatic like feel and while it won't be a perfect match I mean you just listen all you've got to do is replace the real words with gibberish I mean you just listen to the main theme of the Octo Expansion spliced in with rhinestone eyes
Not a perfect match, but very similar. And with Plastic Beach being predominantly water thing themed, like Rhinestone Eyes and Melancholy Hill, it really does just feel like it could go into Splatoon. So when you do do the Salmon DLC, it might be worth giving 2D, Noodle and Russell a call. I can't say about Murdoch as he's in jail right now and we don't know when he's going to get out. But can you imagine if it was still Ace from the Powerpuff Girls? We could get the crazy crossover of the Gorillas cross Splatoon cross Powerpuff Girls if Ace was still the lead guitarist. Which would be stupid and hilarious as the band could easily fit into the, the Splatoon world and pull off that aquatic feel. So yeah, overall though. The music was good. Oh, and also, when I keep saying about Plastic Beach, it's because you literally referenced it, Splatoon. The very first level of the Octo expansion is literally Plastic Beach with the plastic palm trees and all of the rooms made of artificial things that would normally be found on a beach. I bring them up because you referenced it so they would easily fit in. Well, I mean... It's obvious what we need to... It's obvious... The joke I need to make here. What? Well, everything's made of plastic. Oh, oh dear. G give me a second. It's just loading. What, what are you doing? What is this lay joke? Where's my volume? Yeah, just dismiss get out of here. But, putting them aside, yeah, the overall the music is really great, really fantastic, and uh, they did a good job. So also, that's, thank you sir, we're going to move on to the next one sir, but also let Gorillas work on the Salmon DLC that you're definitely going to make. Oh boy, you all got your pickaxes? You ready for a journey into the salt mines? As I know that's what some of you are going to say. And I know a certain bat that's watching this thing is going to say, Oh, it's, it's for the lore and the story. Fuck you! No, it isn't. You should know this. Because I just spent 25 minutes praising the story. And this is not part of the story. But before we get into that, for the most part, because that bit, that's that's in the deep depths of this salt-crusted Chilean sea bass of a campaign. For the most part, like I would say 70% of it, it's the same Splatoon that you know and love and a whole lot more. And the Octo Expansion campaign is far better than Splat 1 or Splat 2 single player combined. As it has that single player story that drags you in and makes you want to go onwards to find out what happens next. But all them samey standard levels that take 10 minutes at a time have just been completely ditched for more fast paced 2 to 5 minute levels made from the same guys that made the Breath of the Wild shrines and put fucking weapon degradation on the Master Sword and Champion weapons, bastards. And like the shrines, as 
stated they are mini dungeons and because they are only mini dungeons, mini challenges to get an orb and not a full on dungeon, it opens up more creative ways to use Link's arsenal or in this case Agent 8's arsenal. So we have some really fun fast paced levels that have a lot of variation like one level is a uh, fun recreation of space invaders where you blast them all down with a minigun there's another level or two where you have permanent ults like the jetpack or the baller and then there's also the grind rail levels where you have to shoot the targets while on the grind rails and if you don't then you just fall and die and due to the fast paced nature of them not being able to stop moving being on a time limit and of course that rocking music as I said before and I say again in this video God, this is some, this is some bloody Spyro nonsense right here when I've been doing those flights. What is that nonsense down there? Oh no. Yeah, it reminds me of the flight games. I mean, you listen to the music and look at the fast paced grind rails side by side with Sunny Flight. That is perfect, that is great, I love that, I fucking love the Octo expansion. Best thing that happened to Splatoon. So 70% of this e expansion, it's incredibly fun and incredibly well done and worth every penny. But Steelhead, oh Steelhead Senpai. They could just not make a fun game, could they Senpai? No. No, 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 of course not. As you know, in Breath of the Wild Shrines, there were some bullshit or lazy things like motion-controlled golf dungeons. Yeah, it's the same here. You're not just getting a nice cake, nah. You gotta have a couple of shit flakes sprinkled on top of the cake for no other reason than fuck you. There's been some that are annoying, but I can deal with them. Like, there's the limited ink one run, limited ink ones that are just kind of shit, really. Not hard, just... Uh, that's annoying. And going from the fast-paced, sunny flight, ooh, grinding on the rails, it's really cool. Oh, no. Now you gotta be really slow and methodical about every single time you pull the trigger. Don't pull it too hard, just a little tap to make sure you just use a little tap of ink. Because if you use too much, you die and you have to start again. Going from the fast paced stuff to that. It just drags the entire thing down and there was just no reason for the limited ink ones. But again, they're just kind of the... Ugh, that was annoying, but I can deal with it. But then... Oh, but then... 
some bright spark had the idea to flip the switch shit switch and crank the diarrhea dial all the way up to 11 and uh, say oh oh I see you're having fun there do you like having fun ha fuck you here we go Fuck you. Mm, yeah, I want to see you fucking suffer. The true Dark Souls begins here. Let me see you shove that ink squelcher right up your ass. And it's just like, why? Why did you do this? And these levels are either just downright lazy and try to hide behind lore, which, as I stated, is total bollocks. And you know it's total bollocks, as literally moments ago, I just spent 25 minutes praising the lore and the story. So, fuck you. Or they're just so fucking infuriating goddamn piece of shit levels that are like, Right, I get it, the Octo expansion is supposed to be a bit harder than the normal expansion, but this is where you took it too fucking far, and you're not going to patch it, because it's been out for two weeks, and you've said you're not going to patch it, and now that just makes you look like a right fucking asshole. And you know the level I'm talking about, the level, like, one of the levels I'm talking about, because everybody had trouble on it, and you can probably guess which one I'm going to say. Do you want to take a guess? Good, you were right. It's girl power, where you have to defend this orb from waves of Octolings. Mmm, a protect mission. They're always good. However, it is rigged as shit. As yes, they will always spawn in a set pattern, so you know where they're going to spawn. But, they have instant ults. So, just for example, if you don't stop them within, oh, I don't know, the first second of them spawning, then that orb is fucking dead. Boom. Dead. And it's bullshit. And nobody likes it, and it's like, you know, the Octoling spawning in waves is bad enough because you're not going to be able to, like, get to one corner, kill them, and get all the way to the other before the orb takes a bit of damage. But then they have their ults instantly. Like, why are they not, like, a regular multiplayer person that has to at least fucking charge it up so that you have some fucking leniency? Is that too much to ask? And I hated it. And there are several Protect the Orb missions. And I hate them because they are so poorly programmed. And it's like, you were doing so well. We had the Spyro Grind Rail levels. They were good. We had the Eight Balls levels. They were interesting. We had the Space Invader level. That was good. And then you just like, here's a piece of shit. I, I, think, I think you're having too much fun. Here's a piece of shit. And it's like... Why? 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 There's no need to. And nobody, not a single person at the Squid Research Lab could have sat down, played that level and been like, Yep, this is perfectly programmed and this won't piss anybody off at all. Nobody could have seen that. How did that get through testing? Did you even test it is the question. And then we move on to the bosses, which are by far the worst part of the expansion and are the absolute laziest pieces of shit that I've ever seen, especially because of what it all amounts up to. So, first of all, the bosses are just lazy uh, XD reskins. So, like, you're going to fight the original four bosses of the Splatoon 2 campaign, being the Toaster, the Samurai... The Octo Shower and Cube Man, except they're a little bit harder. Like, oh, the Samurai, you can only fight him using the baller, so you might get knocked off. And then the, the Toaster's got a couple of extra turrets on the top of him, and it's like, that's just fucking lazy. That is so lazy. And then you've got people being like, yeah, but it's for the law, you know, all of the Octolings got sanitized, which means the bosses have got sanitized. Fuck you! No, they haven't. Right. Number one, point one, the Octo Samurai, or the Q, or even the goddamn toaster, that is a fat bastard. How did that fit in a blender? How did that get ground down into Octoling Smoothie and remade? It didn't. Don't tell me that that guy fit in that tiny blender. Bullshit. Point two, we're in the deep abyssal ocean. And you're like, oh yeah, but the Octolings are your enemies and all the sea creatures are your friends. Again, bullshit. There are sea creatures in the deep ocean that are absolutely terrifying, like an anglerfish. Look at this thing, right? 
You look at this. Do you think that cares? What is a friend and what is an enemy? Or do you think it just wants to eat your face? I think it just wants to eat your face. And you've got so many creative ideas. The anglerfish is obviously the bottom of the barrel. Everybody uses the anglerfish. What about this shrimp with a chainsaw for a claw? That is a goddamn chainsaw. I don't even know how a living creature can actually have a chainsaw for a claw. But that is a real thing. How would... How would you not be able to make a boss fight with a giant shrimp that has a chainsaw for a claw? Or you've got this chimera shark that literally looks like an undead corpse and considering we're blending things into octoling goo, you're telling me you couldn't have the, the phone man stitch together a few fish into, into a chimera zombie fish like this thing? Or what about these vampire fish with the, the horrible vampire teeth that just like latch on to you and oh that looks bloody disgusting there are so many like horrible nasty denizens of the deep not the friendly ones like a couple of jellyfish or sea angels we're talking the nasty things like the anglerfish there are so many like nasties of the deep that you could have easily used and you were just like eh, yeah but you know boss fights uh, I mean Ah, uh, that, that was four taps. I'm, I mean, I've got the script in, but it's so hard to program. Let me try again. Uh, nah, nah, too hard. Just can't be bothered. It, it's so lazy. And this all culminates in the problem with the true final boss. And we won't go to the true final boss for a minute, because in order to get to the true final boss, you have to put yourself through uh, the Defend the Orb mission for real, because... When you do a level, you get a meme cake, or meme cake as people are calling it, so we can make their memes, but you get a meme cake. Hey, that's fine. And every time you get a set of meme cakes, you can take them to this guy. Oh, look at that piece of armor I got. That's quite a nice piece of armor. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I like that, sir. I can't wait to wear my octoling armor in multiplayer, because I am going to be playing as an octoling. I like that, sir. In order to get to the true final boss, you need to do every level without skipping, as if you fail too many times, Marina can just beat the level for you. Just say, boom, test passed. And, well, there you go, done. But you don't get a mem cake. No, no, you don't get a mem cake. So, in order to fight the true final boss, you need to do every level legit, which means you got to do that fucking protect the orb mission legit, as well as all the other ones legit. And, um... After you've done the bullshit ones, because obviously, the, the again, the Space Invader one was great, the 8-ball ones are fine, but after you've done all the ones that'll make you want to snap your Joy-Con joy, your joy -Con in half, or just your Switch in general in half, like the Protect the Orb mission, after you finally do all them legit and beat the final boss of uh, the phone, you get to fight the true final boss. Oh man, well... We didn't really fight the... We didn't really fight the... Boss. It was a fantastic boss fight, the phone. You know, really great boss fight. But we didn't really fight him. We just kind of... Um, saw his Statue of Liberty rise up. And Marina says she's going to drop the hyper bombs on them. And you run around the statue like a Shadow of the Colossus boss fight. Which, again, I really like that aspect of the gameplay. That was really amazing how it was like Shadow... Well, a kid-friendly version of Shadow of the Colossus because the Titans aren't that easy. But, you know, it was really cool to have this Shadow of the Colossus-like boss fight where you've got to run all over the body, hitting the weak points, and then finally grind up to the head and, and blow that last one to completely cover it in ink. And after that, when it's all covered, and it's like, oh, wow, you did great, but he's still charging it. Pearl's like, don't worry, I got this. You pull out a killer whale. Oh, hold on a minute, Pearl, that's cheating. The killer whale was too powerful and got removed from Splatoon 2. Uh, how are you hacking that in? Are you taking that online? Are you you're hacking that in online? Are you cheating? I call hack. She's a hacker. Pearl's a hacker. Shamed of you, Pearl. But, killer whale... That's the Dragon Ball Z beam struggle, and yes, you do have to participate. If you don't rotate your left stick, 
in a clockwise direction to power up Pearl's scream, then the laser will just blast you and kill you. And it nearly blasted and killed me until I figured that I was, uh, because I was just watching it get closer to me. I did one rotation and it's like, oh shit, I knocked it back a bit. I gotta quickly rotate. This is a Dragon Ball B, Dragon Ball Z beam struggle. Oh my god, this is amazing. And then Pearl just blasts the hell through that guy. Fantastic final boss. Amazing final boss. But again, we didn't really do anything. We dropped a couple of Shadow of the Colossus bombs on him. And then and then Pearl got the killing blow with her hyper beam. So we didn't really get to participate that much. And it, he didn't really die. So, oh man, I wonder what the true final boss could be. Oh, it could be anything. It could be amazing. It, I mean, we could actually fight the phone for real. Maybe he has now possessed a real body. We're going to fight him one-on-one. -on -one. No, it's just a reskin of Agent 3. Yeah, that, that boss fight that you fought when I, when I showed you that Octoling goo can possess the Inklings. Yeah, it's just a reskin of that. Just just a res just another lazy reskin. Another terrible, lazy reskin. And what makes it even worse? What makes it even worse? What makes it even more of a piece of shit? And the worst fucking boss in Splatoon history and just so infuriating and so lazy and slapped together is the fact that you are playing as a Octoling from the first game, as in you literally have the HP of uh, an AI Octoling from the first game, i.e. you can't take any damage. One, one pellet one tiny drop of ink from Agent 3's gun and your shield's already broken. Not like a couple of hits like normal. No, one tiny pellet, your shield's already broken. Also, it takes ages. Like, if you throw your bomb, that's all your ink gone and you got to charge it up for ages. Like, you are literally playing as an Octoling from Splatoon 1, but the, the reskinned Agent 3, not only does it have all the health from Splatoon 1, which is a goddamn lot, but it also has infinite ultimates of all the most dickish ultimates like the homing bombs. And you've seen this footage sped up, you've been watching this footage, you'll fight it over and over and over and you can't win because the odds are so stupidly stacked against you. You're never gonna win because the odds are so stacked in your favour or stacked in the game's favour, stacked in Agent 3's favour because you can't even take one hit and it's just like the lost again. It's like Oh, you're playing as the lost. You gotta, you gotta kill Delirium with the lost hair. It's, it's easy. It's easy. You just don't get hit. It's that's how easy it is. You don't get hit. You don't die. Come on, lost. Come on, the lost. Let's just go fight fucking Delirium. You just don't get hit on Delirium. And you're there being like, I oh, can't get hit. Can't get hit. And they're spamming homing bombs. She's spamming the super jump. And it's just like, oh, fuck you. Just stop. Give me a fucking break. But that's not enough. Nah. That's not enough. It's not enough to already be like pelting you with constant shit when you pretty much die in one hit. Well, two, you know, you get one shield and then you die. But th that's not enough for the game. No, no, that's that's not enough. So um, the other thing about Agent 3 is in this reskin fight, they regenerate health. They regenerate health at a alarming rate. Like once... You see an opening, you have to fire at a ridiculous rate and not stop firing at them. And if you see that the bullets come in to kill you, you basically have to stand there and take that gamble. You have to basically play Russian roulette with Agent 3 and hope that you deal enough damage to knock him into the next phase before that shot hits you and dodge away. Because if you shot them a couple of times and you dodge out the way, then that's it. All their health is already back. And now I'm going to show you the fight where I did my best. I got all the way up to the third phase where she was on the UFO, and you have to throw bombs up to her. Now remember, you are an Octoling from Splatoon 1, and your bombs don't come back as quickly as they normally would. So I am now sitting here just 
throwing bombs onto the UFO. You can see the bombs landing on the UFO, and I keep hitting her, and I keep hitting her, but I can't get the three bombs in quick enough succession because she's firing the stupid stingray. I have to dodge out the way. If I get hit by the stingray, it takes away my armor and kills me instantly because the ticks of damage are that fast. So I have to dodge the stingray, but I need to throw the bombs up because if I only throw one bomb up, she just regenerates and here I am. It's still on double speed, constantly throwing bombs, just saying, please, Please go to the next phase, please! And it just wouldn't happen. It just wouldn't happen. So the odds are so fucking stacked against you. And it's it's just terrible. It's just a terrible fucking boss fight. It's, te it's not programmed. It's not fucking tested. It's the, it's just the bed of chaos all over again, where it's like, oh, we made a, we made a soldier of the wasteland delirium bullshit in the hard can't be arsed boss fight. And it's that bad that when Moon, Moon Knight, he wouldn't say no. I said, take a break, stop. You've seen the final boss. You don't You don't need to do it. I'm not fucking doing it again. If you're wondering, no, I didn't beat it. And no, I'm not going to do it again. Because it's, it's, it's fucking trash. It's, it, it's a lazy reskin. You could have had anything for the final boss. And you went with a lazy, lazy fucking reskin. Oh, yeah, but it's for story. Because you, uh, you fought her two years ago when she was fighting Octavio. Yeah, well, guess what? I don't, I don't care. You didn't make it fun. It's not fun. It's, it's horrible. And, oh, oh, it's for law reasons. I don't care about that law. I, I really don't. Because when you, when you had the opportunity, why couldn't we play as Octavio then? Why couldn't we control Octavio's ship? You know, some kind of reward for getting all your stupid meme cakes. But no, you don't get a reward. And it was that bad. I said to Moon, don't play it. You've seen it. Don't do it. But Moon, he just couldn't say no, could he? Couldn't say no. He, he kept going through the night. And he didn't get any sleep. And then he got, he got like, a, a blood pressure up. And then he felt sick the next day. The boss... The boss physically made him ill in real life. And it fucking physically made me ill in real life. Because I was stressed out and pissed off with it. And then... Just to really kick you in the balls, just to really just hammer home how much of a fucking loser you are, how much of a stupid, no-life, weeaboo piece of trash you really are. If you collected all the meme cakes, if you did 100%, if you collected all the meme cakes, and somehow, some way. B Agent 3, the, the, the shitty reskin, with all those odds stacked against you, what do you think you win? Do you think it's like Minecraft or, yeah, Minecraft where you win a cool cape? You know, only those people that have met Notch get that cool cape unless you mod it in. But, you know, a mod, you're not really like one of Notch's closest buddies, but... If, you, if you've been to the first ever Minecon or you met Notch in person, oh, you get one of those cool capes. Do you think if you beat this bullshittingly hard boss, you would get her cape? She's wearing one. Do you think you would get Agent 3's cape? It doesn't affect you. You can still have a headpiece, a body piece, and some footwear on. The cape is just saying you, you did something good. Do you think you get something good like that, an actual real reward that... Everybody can see and they can be like, oh man, that guy got a cape, he's fucking good, he is. No. No. Your reward, your reward for putting yourself through all that shit is a toothpick. It's, it's spray painted gold. It's spray painted gold. That's all you get. You get a golden toothpick. And it's not like a, a fourth cosmetic that you that just appears on your character as a as a visual thing to say you've done it. It's a headpiece, so you literally have to sacrifice one of your your headpieces if you want to wear it. And that this is what it looks like. I found someone that did it. It's it's fucking toothpick. That's it. That's your reward. And it's it's so fucking it's it's so trash. You get, like, uh, an absolutely shit reward from fighting a bullshittingly hard reskin. And it just kind of ruined a lot of the, the expansion. Like, after I fought that, I'm like, I don't care. I just, I just don't feel like it anymore. It's just like, what fucking ever, whatever. I'm 
I'm done with this shit. It's load of bollocks, load of bollocks. But yeah, so I, then I after doing that, I kind of had a sulk for a while and moaned and bitched about how how bullshit the boss was and. Then I relayed all of that into a text document that I'm relaying to you all now. And then we, we move on to the final verdict. So... My final verdict for the Octoling expansion for Splatoon 2 is... A... Above average, but still... I don't know how to say it. It's a 3 out of 5, okay? It's a 3 out of 5, and you'd be like... That's not above average. Above average is a 4 out of 5. Right, well, here's my take on it. Is the Octo expansion worth buying? Yes, definitely. It's well worth your $20. It certainly is worth its money. And I'd be happy to play through it again. There was a lot of fun times that I had with it. It was great. And yeah, good, good. But then there's the, the lazy bosses. That knocks it down a point. There's that fuck awful secret boss, which is just like, no. And then you've got some of the levels like Defend the Orb, which knock it down a second point. And it's like, I really want to give you, I want to say you're above average because you are. You made an incredible story that, that like, led us down this, this portal-esque road to kind of a dark twist at the end. You've set up this professor to be explored more in the Salmon DLC. You did good. All of the test chambers, they're nice, quick, fun, fast-paced for the most part, rather than the same boring, repetitive 10-minute levels from the regular campaign of Splatoon 1 and 2. You did good, I want to say it's above average, but your, your lazy-ass reskins and some of the missions like Protect the Orb, that's two points off. I mean, I can't do it. I'd say it's a 3.5. I can't really split a gem in half. But if I could, it'd be a 3.5. But considering that I, I don't do 0.5s, and it's it's definitely got enough problems to not warrant a 4, it's above average, yes, and it's definitely worth playing and seeing for yourself and enjoying. But it's still only a 3 because it has got quite a lot of flaws. But overall... As I've stated several times in that explanation of why it's above average but still only gets a 3, it is definitely worth your $20 and it's definitely worth playing and enjoying. And I mean, you might as well because you won't be playing online for too much longer unless you buy Nintendo's online pass so you can rent some, uh, rent some NES games just like Blockbusters. Totally not. It's totally not going to turn out the same way as Blockbusters or anything. So, yeah, overall, it's it's really good. The graphics are far better than what they've previously been in just regular Splatoon, like, vanilla. They're on par with all of the new assets, like uh, Salmon Run, because obviously some of the assets from Splatoon 2, like some maps and weapons, were ported over from Splatoon 1, but then you had things like the Salmons and... The actual salmon levels that were made brand new for Splatoon 2 and they were really high quality, really good. And the Octo expansion with like Pearl and Marina's new clothes, the new designs of the creatures, a lot of the new stuff, it's on the same level as Salmon Run. It's as, the, as good as you're going to get in Splatoon 2. Great. The music, absolutely fantastic. It's some of my favourite music. They really pulled it back from the 1.5 update that had that crappy screaming song, which was just terrible. But the Octo expansion managed to pull that back, so the music is absolutely fantastic. And then, of course, the gameplay is just incredibly fun. Like, I, I really enjoyed it more than either of the two campaigns in Splat 1 or Splat 2. Aside from the lazy bosses and certain missions like the limited ink ones and the protect the orb ones. So, yeah, overall it's great. And, um, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. This video has been going on for quite some time, and I will be slightly honest. I I kind of wasn't too motivated to make this. I've got a couple of reviews coming out, and two of them are kind of mocking, which is Command and Conquer Rivals from EA and Five Nights. What what number are we on? Seven. I think it's seven. He made a fucking seventh one. And that's that's kind of like a mocking one, and I wanted to try like a, a new type of thing there, where I'm I'm talking from the perspective of a developer. But more importantly, I kind of wanted to get this one out of the way, as I'm pretty much ready now on the second channel. I'll be after doing the two quick ones of Command and Conquer and E FNAF Seven. I'll be pretty much reading out my lines and putting some visuals together so get get ready for it and that's why I kind of didn't do the Patreon and that's why the Patreon is a little bit late but don't worry the only Patreon is the lovely Bird Moon Knight so thank you very much Moon Knight for your donation really do appreciate it but as I say I, I didn't really do it this month because now after after all my scripting and planning I am ready to start doing Inspiration the the little series that I've had planned for a while. If you don't know what that is, I've got a video somewhere that talks about it. But once that video is actually like put together and done, it'll be uploaded on my other channel because that's the one that I predominantly want for other content. And again, when it's done, I'll go more in depth on that. And then you can go watch it and you can be like, ah, see, I see. And as I was typing the two episodes, because the first one has to be the way it is because of certain aspects of the video and you kind of need to explain what you're doing and explain like why you're doing it so the first one kind of has to be the way it is for reasoning but then the second one is just like every every dip video that you would see after that like the the formula so to speak so yeah once them are up they're, they're going to be good, but when I was scripting mainly the second one and I was I was typing stuff in, I'm like, I'm actually really excited to work on this. And it's like, yeah, but you still got that Octo expansion that's sitting on Camtasia, just half finished. And I'm like, oh man, I, I, I'm, and because it was so long, it's just like, oh uh, no. But a lot of the reviews are going to be a, a lot shorter. And again, I want to focus on something that I think you're, a lot of you are really going to like, so... More on that probably next week, but for now I'm just going to go, I'm going to say thank you for watching, uh, if you like this review do please feel free to leave a like, it helps out the channel, if you don't want to miss out on the other reviews then don't forget to hit the subscribe button and bing the bell so the notifications go through, and of course there are links down below to the public discord if you want to come in and talk to me, as well as a link to my twitter if you want to see what I'm tweeting. And of course, a um, link to my Patreon if you would like to support me further, like Moon Knight. Which, honestly, I I think uh, I think I might be getting a little bit extra support after that new thing comes out because, as I say, I think you're all really going to enjoy one of the two main pieces that's going to go on the other channel, and that other channel is going to be only for those videos. Like all of the random blog videos and reviews and stuff will go on here, but. The two big projects that I've got planned will be predominantly on there, but more on that next week once I do the two quick Command and Conquer and FNAF 7. But for now, thank you for watching. I, I do appreciate the watches and the subscribes, and I'll see all of you in the next video.